Um, so this will be excessively basic for the people that already have Rhino experience, perhaps. But then your uh, design should be really amazing. And even this, though this is like the 10th time I've given this lecture, I still love this lecture. So what we're going to be talking about is the commands that you type in here and like visualizing what they do. Um, the way that Rhino is set up is there's a bunch of tools up here. Um, oh, I don't even have my buttons. I must have moved them. Hmm. So let's just fix this because I don't think mine looks the same. So this window might not be here, but it might be over here. So this is your properties tab. This is your layers. This is your display, which I never use, and help, which I also never use, but I used to use. Sometimes not that helpful. So we won't really use this for a while. Um, what is sort of been a legacy of old school Autodesk is the typing of commands. So back in the 80s, early 90s, an entire digital plan would have been typed. Like you would say, zero if you were drawing a line you would literally say the line starts at zero it moves at zero angle in x direction like you're typing all of this stuff and moving it up and copying it and offsetting it it's all typed commands now it's kind of a hybrid but still the typed command for a lot of people dominates um, it's also easier to communicate that way uh, the one thing I don't like about these buttons is even to this day, I kind of like, for example, forget like, oh, edit points on versus points on and I click on the wrong one and it can be a little bit problematic. But just so you know that there are buttons, there are also commands and all of those can be accessed by typing a word here. There are also four windows, uh, top, perspective, right, front. Everyone works differently. I work with four often. And if you want to not have all this clutter, you just double click at the very top. So, it's very easy to navigate through this. So the first thing we're going to get through are these vocabularies. So again, for some, this is excessively simple, but I'm pretty 99% sure not ever, you guys don't know all these commands or how wonderful they can be. Um, so the first thing is extrude. So like I said, extrude is a very random term. But what extrude really means is taking a two-dimensional thing and turning it into a three-dimensional thing. So you can take a curve, so type rectangle, and take a curve. Doesn't really matter, we're not doing anything to dimensions yet and you type extrude. So the, another good thing about the typing commands within Rhino 
is you now have started to type extrude and these are all the commands that have to do with extruding in Rhino. And that can be super helpful when you kind of don't know what you need to do, but you have a good idea. So you're like, I want to extrude it. Well, here's extrude curve. This is a curve. That makes sense. And that's an extrusion. If you type extrude again, just to see what they have, which I do frequently, um, you can also extrude surfaces. So we'll get into what that really means. So right now, I started off with a rectangle that is a curve, and now I have this sort of wire frame around it. But you really don't know what that is in this viewport, um, and this is really true for when you start to get, when you're new to Rhino, uh, the sort of optics of it is very important. So right-clicking on perspective or in whatever tab you are in, you have the opportunity to change the viewport to all these wonderful things. And I encourage you to explore these options for your final, um, your final images for Tuesday. So shaded, though, is a pretty important one to look at. So now I clearly understand that by clicking here, this is a curve and this is a solid object. So the next thing that we're going to look at is planar surf. So actually generating surfaces. Again, we can take a rectangle so just typing rec and it will pop up. We can also click here and find rectangles. We can also click in this wonderful polygon and do polygons. So once you have a curve and it's planar, you can turn it into a surface. And all you do is type planar surf. SRF. And now you've turned a curve into a surface. You can now extrude this surface. And now you've turned that surface into a 3D extrusion. So this is the basic vector to 2D to 3D strategy. When I did my first project in 2009 in Rhino, I knew how to extrude, bend, copy, scale. And I did an entire first semester Masters of Architecture from Pratt Institute project based on those four commands. So this, this is just the most basic thing. Um, if you master like five of these commands, you can still do oh so much. Another important... Mm -mm -mm. We'll do that one next. So sometimes when you extrude the curve, this is an, the next part of Rhino, trying to be helpful. It is asking for additional input. So in this command, you have typed in extrude curve and hit enter. Now it's saying, do you want to change the direction? Do you want it to be on both sides? So if you click that, it will now be extruding on both sides. You can make it solid. And then now it doesn't have a top on it. So as you model, you'll start to realize that's valuable and sometimes it's not, but either way, the next vocab is cap. So if you accidentally extrude something and you want to put the top and bottom back on it, you click on your object, type cap, and hit enter. And now it has a top and a bottom.
And so some more obvious ones. So yes, control C, control V works. It's not really good because it's harder to control C, control V with um, precision. So you should always type copy, enter, and you can copy everything everywhere. Maybe even more precisely than that. See, it just went wherever it wants, but that's okay for now. And then similarly, there is a way to sort of drag these around using a thing called a gumball. So you can do that. So if you click on this button down here, it's called gumball. You can drag things that way. I am old school and we did not have gumball back in whenever I started learning. So I always type move and move very specifically. So that is to each of your own. So now you've learned the most boring things possible. Extrusion, planar surf, offset surf, cap, group, copy, move. You know how to navigate the windows and you know how to draw curves. So that's all great and super boring, but necessary to navigate. So just to recap, when you want to type a command, you start typing it. You can either click on it here, or you can type the whole command and hit enter. I think some of you who are new to the software will soon realize that um, enter exists in three buttons. It is your right click mouse button, enter and space bar. So just be aware. So the next thing we're going to look at are um, scaling strategies. And there is just endless, endless, endless tools in here. One of the So here is a polygon array, and you can find tons of weird things to just model. So we're just going to put a pyramid in here. Done. Pyramid. Great. That's exactly what I wanted. But just to start with a sort of polygon so that I can demonstrate the next things. So the first one is kind of like basic creation. The next of these commands is pretty much um, modification techniques. So for example, you all kind of understand scale, right? I'm going to type scale, hit enter, it's going to prompt me to copy. No, I don't want to copy. But it's saying origin point. So I need to come down here and click a point of origin. And then it's scaled. It's very simple. Right? Scale, origin point, one point, two points. If you ever get lost, you just follow the prompts up here. Beyond scale, there is scale 1D. So scale 1D means you are scaling in, Nate, what does scale 1D mean? One direction. <laughs> so if you're scaling in one direction, that means that XYZ you would only be scaling in the X or only scaling in the Y. I didn't find out about this until I was like two years after my master's and I was like a crying shame because it's such a useful tool. Yes, William. A specific size. Well, what I usually do for that is, well, you can, you sort of have to draft it so for example, I want, I'm going to rotate this just so. So 
So if I want this edge to be 200, I can grab this scale. Origin point will be here. Scale factor of first reference point. The first reference point is your actual object. Your final reference point is what you want it to be. And now that edge is 200. Magic. You can do the same with scale 1D. And then scale it however you like. So again, this technique is I'm going to just go to the top view for the rest of these. So scale 1D, origin point, it can be wherever you want. The scale factor, it's still looking for or first reference point. I'm just going to click up here. And then you can scale it however you want. It's very flexible, but they're always a three-click process. Now I have this strange, skinny pyramid, hexagon thing. It's great. It's just looking awesome. Scale 2D. I, I think we can all figure out what that means now. So scale 2D means that you will be scaling in two dimensions. This is when having multiple windows is really helpful because if you are in perspective and you are scaling 2D, it gets confused. But for example, I know that I want the two dimensions to be in the front view because I think it's too tall now. Then you just go to front view, scale 2D, and it will scale in that view, but not in the plan. Do you guys see how that's working? It's kind of hard because it's so skinny. But it's not scaling in a uh, sort of perfect way. The thickness here is staying the same. If I come here and start scaling it, the height staying the same. You can see in the perspective that the height will stay the same. So scale 2D does two dimensions in either direction. So these are not on the list, but just so you know, Zoom comes up with a whole bunch of wonderful things. So if you lose your model, Zoom and then extents. Zoom all and then extents means you get all your windows to zoom everything. So if you lose your stuff, and you will because everyone does. So the more fun things are commands like bend. So bend is exactly how you imagine it. It makes it bend, but you can get it quite. So now we're like getting into something like extremely more interesting than a polygon. And you can do the bend command. All you do is you type bend, hit enter. It's asking you to start the spine. Honestly, these things, I still, I intrinsically know what it's going to do, but I still have to test it out every time. Okay, so now I'm making a ram swarm very easily. So skilled. But this is not what I wanted to do. Just like all your other softwares, you can control Z and it will go back. You can control Z, I think, the whole thing. And I've done that before because I've really screwed it up and then didn't do a duplicate. So control Z is your friend and it will be fine. So then let's try another bend. Let's do it again in this axis. Okay. So I 
I have no idea what's going on here, but as you can start to see, it's getting really hard to see. And there's a lot of things going on here because, I, I mean, that I know and we won't get in today, the model's not very good. But what I would do is change it to rendered mode or some other mode to see if it's better. Quite frankly, what's happening right now is it's inside out and I'm gonna go back because it'll probably crash soon, but that's uh, what's happening to the model. So remember, if you're having trouble seeing things, adjust the view. Um, oh, stretch, super fun. Type stretch. You start the axis again, just like everything else. Finish the axis and then pull. This is different than scale 1D. Um, so now it's like stretched out, as it sort of implies. There is another command called sweep. So let's just go straight to what that is. So sweep is another like sort of series of commands that let's go to help type sweep one and it uses curves to generate surfaces. And I think this is really helpful to do precise modeling. And so for example, plans, we will often just extrude rectangles. But what if the wall is curved? What you need to do is extrude it along a curve. So that's why sweep is a really valuable tool. So let's say we have this crazy curve that is the best thing ever. And I want it to then, in perspective, go that way. So there's no way to sort of extrude this. So in my first Rhino experience, what I would have done is I would have extruded this. And again, so it's going both ways, so I don't want that, so I'm just gonna click off. Would be to extrude this and then, this is not good, I would have bent it somehow magically to that curve. There's much easier ways to do that. You grab the curve, you type ex sweep one. The one means rail. These are your cross section curves. You can have multiple, but you can only have one or two rails and I'll demonstrate that. So, so sweep one, enter, select cross section curves, enter, Oops. select the rail. So the first curve you select is your rail. Again, that's what the curve will flow along. The next prompt you will have is a section curve. Then you will get this. In this case, not much will change. It will look this way. Um, if you mess with these, some things do change, but for your sort of use, it won't matter. And then you hit OK. And now you have this sort of profile. I think for most industrial designers that already have predefined profiles, this is pretty normal. And then just to go one step for further and talk about
say you wanted to do something for whatever reason that was more like this. Um, you wanted it to start here, but you wanted it to taper. You had specific reasons for doing that. You can do sweep two. Again, the two indicates the rails. So it's saying select your first rail, click. Select your second rail, click. Select cross section curves, click. All right, great, that's exactly what I wanted. Perfect. Also, you can also say, well, I want it to be like wavy down here, but it needs to look different by the time it gets to the top. That means you add a cross section. So again, sweep two, select your first rail, select your second rail, cross section curves, select one. This is our first original cross section curve. This will be our new cross section curve. And now you have that. Okay, if that's what you want. So those are sort of different ways to achieve um, your goal. Uh, there are different techniques again. So lofting, type loft, will just connect this curve to this curve. Sweeping is a version of lofting, but it gives you directions. Again, you will be prompted by this pop-up window and ask you some strange questions that typically don't do anything but you click OK. So now you have a lofted surface. Um, but then also, which happens frequently in any discipline, is you just need like a pipe. Well, Rhino hears you and says, you just type pipe in. And you define the radius. So you can actually drag to define the radius. And then hit Enter, Enter, and you have a pipe. This is very handy. Instead of walking around extruding circles around curves. Um, so another modifying technique is twist. You grab this, you type twist. To this day, I really don't know how twist works, but I think it's very fun to play with. Um, in the sort of scheme of form generation. There is, oh, Bend was in there twice. There is a thing called cage edit, which is every time I, um, I sort of do desk crits with my students. They don't know about this, so it's a very important one to know. Uh, so you type in, and they always get it wrong, but it's uh, by far an incredibly valuable tool. So there are different ways of that modeling takes place. There is this way, which is sort of this typing strict methodology. But if you get into Maya and Max, it's kind of like playing with clay, or that's their intention. Cage Edit allows you that sort of flexibility, and it will build a parametric cage around your object and allow you to modify it based on 16 points, let's say. That's more of a NURB modeling, which is a Maya-based program. Um, and so sometimes, if we're not being super precise, um, and we're generating sort of more spatial things or more freeform things, this is an incredibly useful tool. Um, and I use it all the time. So cage edit, and everyone gets it wrong. So cage edit, enter. Select control object. You have to click bounding box. You have to click bounding box. Or nothing's going to happen. Then it's asking you coordinate system. It's saying, do you want to coordinate the system based on the world? Yes. Are these enough points for you, for your use? Yes. Do you need a region to edit global? Yes. The most important thing is to click bounding box, or you'll never have your cage. And you'll just be like, Leslie, bounding box isn't working. 
and then I'll click on, or like cage edit's not working, happens over and over again. So now you see these wonderful points. Yeah. So now I can grab this part and move it over there. Oh, it's because I'm in maybe render mode. We'll change that. If your computer starts to slow down, change your view. I'm crashing. Crash your Roonies. Shaded. So now, now we're starting to get Zaha Hadid. Yeah, it's good. So now you can like really modify your form in a very strategic way. Typically, I like to grab a bunch of points. Let's say this, all of these points, so this whole face, and do something like scale 1D. Yeah, it's becoming very complex geometry. This will happen to you too. It will be very complex uh, and frustrating, but it's kind of the learning, learning curve of the software. So those are pretty much the, the polygon modification tools. I will show you one last technique and then we'll be, oh, we won't do that one. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. One last technique and then uh, finish up with how to save it and create views and then we'll be done anyways. So. This is sort of like, I've made a shape and now I'm going to play with it. Often, and I did this frequently with my fashion designers when I taught fashion designers how to 3D model, they work specifically with um, surfaces. Like that's sort of the language in which they operate. So flow along surface is a very wonderful tool for them. So the first thing, let's just uh, start with the surface. Oh, surf, sorry. Yeah, I'll just start with plane. And then what I usually do is I turn the points on, well, I'll just bend it a little bit to make it strange. So it's a little curving. Let's stretch it a bit. Okay, so we have this kind of curvy, excessively complicated, but curvy surface. For all disciplines, this is uh, helpful. Um, let's say you want to make apertures in a wall. Let's say you want to um, put ridges on a sort of industrial object. All of these are handy. So first things first, when you type flow along surface, these are pretty complex um, commands. So if you get lost, just type it and see how the commands are in help. So you select your objects, you select the objects is the objects you want to flow along the surface. You select a base of a surface near a corner. So there's a base surface. What's a base surface? We'll get to that. And then you select your target surface. And that's always our goal is the target surface. So even to this day, I sometimes struggle with this command, but it's just worth knowing. So let's just again say we want some spheres. We want, just like their command was, we want to take spheres 
and flow along this surface. Um, this one is not written down, but is a handy one. It's called Array. You pick, it's, it's advanced copying. You pick the number in the X direction you want, let's say 10. The number in the Y direction you want, 10. So I want a field of flat spheres. And then the number in the zero in the Z, I want one. I don't want two, because so that will just keep going up. That'll make a three-dimetric volume. Enter. And now it's asking for unit cell spacing. Click here, and voila. You have this endless, it's advanced copying. But again, I'm showing you this now. I didn't find out about Array until like five years after I started Rhino. And it is so helpful. Uh, also, if you come from a different background, so when I started teaching graphic designers, they'd be like, can you align? I was like, I don't know, I've never aligned. Typed align and it was there. So if you think you have an idea of what you wanna do, just type and see if it's there. Because there are even commands that I don't know because I got complacent and I just carry on. So let's say these are the objects that we want to flow along this surface. We want this to bend and shape like this. So based on the comments, we need objects, a base surface, and a target surface. These are our objects, these are our target surface. We now have to make a base surface. This is what I always forget and it's always annoying. So we're gonna do another plane, which is a surface, and do a sort of box around it. You can also draw a rectangle and type planar surface. It's important to go in and look at where this is sort of hitting in your model. So if you use this, the surface will be in the center. If you move it down, it will be at the bottom. If you move it up, it'll be at the top. So the reason it can't exist without this base surface is it doesn't, it needs to know mostly in the Z where you want this to correlate. I'm gonna put it like here so that it's mostly there. So last but not least, saving. This might crash my computer, I'm not sure. You know, I usually don't do things like this, but it might. So it's very important that you start saving. If you lose an untitled work, I don't think it auto saves. So you have an auto save built in, and I think the standard is 20 minutes, but you should typically go ahead and save before you get started, just on the desktop. Sorry, any terrible things are happening. Mm -hmm. It's like nothing is happening. I do not know why it takes so long. Anyways. All right, so now I'm gonna grab my objects. So you get used to selecting objects. You can grab one at a time, hold shift, and select multiple. But Rhino tries to help you out with what, how to select objects. And again, this only comes with practice. If you marquee from the left to the right, everything that you completely select will be selected. If you marquee from the right to the left, anything the marquee touches will be selected. So if I marquee to here, I'm only gonna get this one circle, but if I marquee just to touch them from that way, then I get both. Again, it's like practice, you get used to this. You can also go about clicking on everything, but as you see when there's overlap, 
they're trying to help you out. You'll see this will happen to you a lot. You will have an option to select what you want. So it's important while you're doing this to practice the selection process. So flow along surface. Select objects to flow. I'm going to select from the right to the left all the spheres. Press enter when done. Enter. Base surface. Select near a corner. All right. This corner works. Target surface. Select near a matching corner. Okay. This can be a like tough thing to sort of establish what is the closest matching corner, but Right here, whatever, fine. Think, think, think. That's why I said it might crash. This is what I was saying about crashing. But it's okay, the key is to be patient. Like at this exact moment, it's time to go get a cup of coffee, right? Do not panic. If it's really screwed up for 15 minutes, then abort, just give it all up. But you should definitely be patient. And so now we have this beautiful, weird thing that I love. I'm gonna just hide this. Oops. I mean, I basically love anything that's like pillowy and, and this is really hard to see, so we'll go in rendered mode. Yay, that's exactly what I wanted. It's like petals falling off a tree, I don't know. So essentially, it's created a sort of parametric unit-based shapes that are decided from this corner to this corner. Um, you can also, which is very important for the, um, you can also do apertures, but we won't go there because we don't really have time. But this is how you achieve that. So you have a surface, you want a surface over it, flow along surface is your best way to do that. You could have also achieved this by selecting everything and bending it. So. That's about it for modeling. Um, one other thing I have on the list is about saving views, but we can go over that later. So basically what I expect for Tuesday is to do something wonderfully eloquent like this beautiful design I just created, and then to do a screenshot. So on PCs, it's called a snipping tool. Um, I might adjust and go to x-ray something, find something nicer than shaded. Oh god, am I going to kill my computer over this? Wasn't worth it. Oh, that's not bad. Um, and then do a snip of it. So new. Beautiful. And again, since this is advanced digital media, I assume that all of you are capable of taking this image into Adobe and then overlaying the text of chain commands. So what I mean by that is I would take this image and graphically nicely, because you guys are all designers and you're advanced, I would put sphere, array, flow along surface. Or basically this was a fear, uh, I would put that I drew a plane, I bent it, I stretched it, and then spheres, array, flow along surface. Those are the six things I did to achieve this. Okay, so three of those. Again, I just did this one in like 15 minutes. 
So that's it. Um, class is over in 20 minutes. So if you have any questions, um, let me know right now. If you have any software issues, you should try and download Rhino now if you are planning on doing that. In the event, I can help you. But that's all for now.